So, David, welcome to the show. And, you know, we love having incredibly successful people on the show to share their stories. We love that. And we know you come from humble beginnings like AJ and myself. So now that you've made it, what do you think the biggest myth is about success? It stands right behind me, right? That money buys happiness. But I think worse than that, it's that money doesn't buy happiness. And what do I mean by that? I think there's this crux that you, there's two schools. It's like Republicans and Democrats. There's no middleware. I'm, I'm, I'm the middle of the road money guy because I believe money doesn't buy happiness or love, but money is the number one priority in my life in this world because it allows me to shop. And where people don't put their focus is I've learned to shop for the right thing. So for example, when I was young, like you guys, I lived in a world of not enough. I was a victim. Why me? Why me? Why can't I have that? And money drove me. It was going to buy, you know, it was a driver. And then I made millions of dollars and money became a world of just for me. I was buying things I didn't need, different things I didn't need to impress people I didn't even like. <laughs> and then this world of abundance with money that I live in now is really simple. If I shop for the right things, community centers in Africa, if I shop for scholarships for kids to go to school, to support the mental health initiatives that I'm supporting right now, junior achievement, all the things I believe in, money's super important. I can impact the world with $10 billion, a lot more than my terrific mom impacted the world as a second grade teacher who raised six kids on her own. I appreciate that. I love that but I want to have a huge impact of empowering over a billion people. And I need a ton of money to do that. And I think shopping for the right things, the biggest myth, people are confused about how money can buy happiness. Now, was there a specific event in your life that made that switch for you? Because I feel like so many of us buy into that myth. Yeah, there was. And I, irony is I rock bottomed two years before I lost everything. So in 2008, I lost over $100 million, went bankrupt, which was my greatest fear growing up. The biggest shame I could ever have would be to admit that I was not financially successful, that I had lost all my money. But two years before that, actually three things happened. I'm gonna tell these things really quickly, but these are the three things that build up to the biggest change in my life, what I call the quantum shift of my life, two years before I lost everything. One, when I was 30 years old, my dad gave me the first birthday present in 20 years. I'd hated my father for 20 years because he was a liar, a cheater, manipulator, back-end seller who had forgotten my birthday when I was 10 and lied to me and said he didn't believe in birthdays, even though he was celebrating everybody's birthday. And at five, he was my hero. But he gave me a jacket at 30 that had no pockets. And he told me that it was because I was just like him, that I had to learn that money doesn't buy love, and that I should hang the jacket to remind me that I could not take anything with me when I was gone. He didn't want me to be the richest man in the cemetery. And I told my dad when I was 30, F off, I hate you. You're a liar, a cheater, manipulator, overseller, back end seller. You're full of sh and I'm nothing like you. Six years later, the second incident happened. Six years later, I was running Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, most notable sports agency in the world, representing every great celebrity athlete and entertainer. I could go anywhere backstage, sidelines. So I invited my best friend, Rob, who I've known since the fourth grade, to go to the Masters with me, to the cabins with Curtis Strange, hang out with the Hall of Famers, the private jet parties. And he said, no, I don't want to go with you. I was like, Rob, golf's your favorite thing. The Masters is the number one bucket list thing in the world. And I'm going to give you full access to the Masters. How can you tell me no? He said, Dave, I don't like who you hang out with and what you do. And I was like, Robbie, I'm not doing what those guys are doing. And he told me something that shook my world. He said, Dave, you can lie to me all you want, but don't lie to yourself. He's the first person in decades that told me no. I, I, there's a great book out there, Don't Take Yes for an Answer written by an entertainment agent, um, I was taking yes. I was believing all my own BS and I was living in this world of for me. Two weeks later, my life would change. I go to the Grammy Awards with Little John, the rapper, and uh, I lied to my wife. She told me not to go. I lied to her, told her I had a business meeting. I changed clothes in the car. I came home 5.30 in the morning, wasted out of my mind. My wife, <laughs> Johnny likes that. I, 
I, I, my wife was waiting for me. Now I've known my wife since the fourth grade. In fact, my friend Rob, who two weeks uh, earlier told me the truth, he asked my wife to go steady for me at sixth grade camp and embarrassed me because she said, no, tell me to ask him himself. And he yelled it in front of everyone. Uh, so my wife and I had known each other. She hated me until, of course, I reaffirmed that money about love and happiness because she married me. Uh, but anyway, I came home for the first time in my wife and my relationship. She told me she wasn't happy. She told me I better take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become. And she told me she was leaving me because if I didn't take stock in who I was, she felt I was going to die that I had not been paying attention to my children, her, or my business, and that she didn't want to sit around and watch the disaster coming. I told her to F off. <laughs> I said, how dare you? Look around you. You know what kind of car I have in the I mean, I was an idiot. I, I was not ready to hear it. I go, I go to sleep, wake up hungover, thinking about how I was going to take my wife's happiness. I was going to take all the money, get divorced. I was a lawyer. I'd find an, another great divorce lawyer. And then my life would change. This is how the universe coincides for your favor, to push you in the right direction. I'm about to call the lawyer. I look over in my closet, and guess what jacket is shining like the natural's bat and, the, and you know, Robert Redford standing there. That jacket is staring at me. And I, I can barely tell the story without choking up because I looked at that jacket and I realized that I'm the cheater, that I'm the liar, that I'm the manipulator, overseller, backend seller, and that I hated my father for only one reason, because I hated myself. And I told myself that I was gonna literally take stock in who I was. And at that time, I couldn't get this idea that I had given my life to receive things. My mom had taught me, the more you give, the more you receive. My mom had always given everything to receive. And it hit me as I went through gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, that, wait a second, I got this backwards. I'm gonna receive with complete confidence so I can give. I'm gonna allow the universe to come through me, not for me or to me. I'm not gonna live in scarcity anymore. I'm not gonna live in fear. I'm not gonna be an overseller, back-end seller that has to trade and negotiate everything, including giving. I just was simply gonna focus in on receiving as much as I can to give to others, and that changed my life. And I've been on a 15-year-old 15 15-year 15 journey uh, to do so, I've been doing free trainings on Fridays for over 20 years, but now specifically to empower people into abundance. In other words, to empower others to be happy and to empower others to be happy as well. David, so with that, uh, number one, the book you're referring to is written by Steve Hers. He was on our show and he is fantastic. And I loved the book and the interview. Um, so uh, just to note that, but also- Thank you. Um, there was- so you're mentioning about how you got caught up in this, in the, in the money train. You're looking for the things that are going to buy you everything that you feel that you're going to need in order to be happy. Do you remember any point with, with such a disdain for your father and what you felt he represented, how you fell in that trap? Is there any sort of breadcrumbs that you can remember that, that started leading you in that, in that direction? Yeah, uh, first, as a child, I was jealous of everyone that had money. And two, I wanted the only, I was very happy as a child. My mom was amazing. And she was sad when we didn't have enough money. She would cry when the car would break down, or she was worried about how she was going to spend her, her, you know, your kids to college and graduate school so the fetus could fully be developed you know it was an extraordinary thing but I just wanted to buy my mom a house in a car and then what happened was I made a million dollars nine months out of law school and everything I did after that just kept reaffirming that money buys love and happiness including you know I married my dream girl who hated me in junior high school and high school and all of a sudden this girl all of a sudden is in love with me and she hated me for all those years. And I, you know, everything I touched, you know, everyone, I talked about money, they talked about my money, they talked about my cars. And if I wasn't happy, I would just buy more things. If I wasn't happy, I'd buy different things. And I just couldn't get it until finally those three things aggregated over those six years into teaching me a valuable, valuable lesson. My favorite thing about my story is losing everything and having to tell my mom that not only I was bankrupt, but that I had lost her house because I didn't take it out of my name. And the only reason I ever wanted to be rich 
was to buy her a house and I had to stand at her door and in my mind thinking I'm going to crush her, like, you know, Elizabeth, I'm coming, you know, she would die. And she didn't even blink when I told her that she had to move and I had lost everything. All she said was, honey, are you okay? I love you so much, do you need any money to borrow? And to me, to understand why my mom and my wife, who were always so, you know, not money oriented, would tell me that I was lost my entire life. You're lost, you don't get it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You make $17,000 a year. People pay me 50 grand to stand on a stage. I don't get it, are you kidding me? Well, I do get it now. And I totally understand what my mom understood and what she finally taught me. And one of the important takeaways that you mentioned is this practice of gratitude. And I think for many listening, it's, it's easy for us to feel grateful when we have $100 million and we're on the <laughs> high horse. But then to hit rock bottom, how do you start practicing gratitude when you have, in your mind, nothing? Yeah, it's so cool because my mom, when I had nothing to start, would make me go back to my room if I wasn't grateful. If I had a bad attitude, she'd say, turn around. You're not coming to my table with that mindset. Go find the light, the love, and the lessons in this day, or you're not coming to the table. And so I had a great foundation to learn from. What really helped me was understanding pain, too. Uh, you know, I never was a quitter. I, I'm like a Rudy, a Rocky, you know, a little train that could. That's just the energy and the attitude I've always had. But for me, this idea that pain was always a stop sign. Oh, that, you know. I'm losing mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, financial pain. Stop, go different, quit. You know, and so many people, in fact, I believe 99% of the people quit because of pain before they get to 25% of the way there. 1% one, 1 remain, 99% of the 1% quit before they get to 50% because they think pain's a stop sign. What I realized through gratitude, that pain became a turn signal. All it was was an indicator that I had something to learn that if I could find the light, the love, and the lessons, and the pain, that it would push me to a better place, a better position, a better situation. And so that turn signal strategy changed my life. And I literally tell everyone, this is how far in our way it is. I speak all over, and I tell people, you wanna change your life, just say thank you before you go to bed and when you wake up. That's what my mom made me do. Just say thank you. 30 straight days, it'll become part of your subconscious. It'll start effect affecting your quantum memory, your, your actual unconscious competency. Just say thank you. Say it every day for 30 days. In fact, if you do, text me. I literally will send you a free book, sign it, and congratulate you. But more importantly, your life will change. Half the people will listen to, to this, and by tonight, they won't say thank you. Another half will forget by tomorrow morning, and within three days, almost all of us won't say thank you. Now, to give me credibility, I've made over $100 million several times in my life. I have studied physics, quantum physics, and metaphysics. I sit on the Transformational Leadership Council with people like Bob Proctor, Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, Sharon. You can name the names of transformational people, Deepak Chopra, all who agree gratitude's the most powerful truth and potential in the universe, and yet, it took me nine months before I could, uh, and I'm being honest, everyone, it took me nine months before I could make it 30 days without forgetting morning and night to say thank you, even though all of that proof that it changes your life is there. Math, scientists, experts, and yet it took me nine months. Why is that the problem, right? To me, we don't look at the real, real means of what the problem is. Gratitude's obvious to everyone. They get it. They know that gratitude helps. But how do we get to that deeper effect? And that's why, you know, Atomic Habits by James Clear. I always forget Steve's last name. Uh, James Clear gets all the credit. But Atomic Habits is such an important book to me because I want to teach people how to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of their potential for the greatest things that are so simple that will change our lives. That practice alone, and it's, it's simple in nature, starts to train your brain to look for the right things. So many of us live our life shining our flashlight in the opposite direction, looking for all of the things that could go wrong in the future and wrapping ourselves in anxiety around it. And I think right now, especially with what's going on, many of us are struggling to feel grateful. But if you're listening to this, odds are you have a ton of reasons to feel grateful. You're on a device. You have your health. There are so many things working to our advantage. And if you could start your day and end your day, looking for those things instead of looking for all the things that you did wrong and looking for all the things that other people have, 
you certainly would be on that path to transformation. Absolutely. And this is the season of voting. You know, McCourt and I have a show, Get Out and Vote, for the next 13 days. Everyone, I think, has a responsibility and obligation and a privilege to vote. I don't care who you vote for. Just go vote. The bigger picture of voting to me is my life changed when I realized there's three votes that we make every day. You either vote for what other people want for you, and then you end up with what other people want elected in your life and you resent them, or you vote, like you're talking about, what we don't want, which most people do, they vote for what they don't want in their life, it's elected in their life and they wonder why. Or you can use gratitude to find the light, the love and the lessons and you vote for what you want in your life and it will be elected in your life, it's that simple. And gratitude and forgiveness are two of the mechanisms combined with accountability that allows you to say, what did I do to attract this to my life and what am I supposed to learn with it? If you put those three things into practice, gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability, you will not only be motivated to get up, get back up, get started, get restarted, but you'll live inspired, in spirit, connected to the greatest source of light, love, and lessons through you and connected to everyone else. A tree has no branches. Too many branches are fighting with each other right now. They're gonna kill the tree. That visual is so powerful. I think everyone can resonate with that exact concept. And so many in our audience find themselves frustrated with toxic people, negative people in their life, and they want the high value people. They want the people who are positive. Well, you have to bring that gratitude to the table. That becomes the light that attracts those positive people into your light by. You nailed it. I call it a variance feeding chain. If you start looking, this is what changed. But my wife started the variance feeding chain for me. She said, here's three friends of yours. If we're going to stay married, you got to go fire these three, three friends. They bleed you. They bleed you. And you need to feed the people that are feeding you, like your wife, your children, your family, the guys that you're working with. You're, you're, you're in the wrong track. So I created this variance feeding chain where it's, okay, to a variance, who's feeding me so I can feed them? Then if you're not feeding me to a variance, how close am I going to let you be with me? And then on the bleeding side, all the way to the fact that I'll let you fall away. Some people that bleed me, I just let them fall away. Other people like these three friends, I had to call and I simply, people ask me, how the hell you fire a friend? I called them and said, hey, this isn't about you. And one of my friends was from elementary school. This isn't about you. This is about me. I don't like myself when I'm with you. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be allowed uh, I'm not going to allow myself to be with you because I don't like myself when I am. Please, this is about me, not you. I really appreciate your friendship over all these years, but I can't be around you. And that was the last I've ever talked to those three people. That's certainly quite a shift. And especially to hear something like that from your wife and then to take it in, to be honest with yourself and, and to say, wow, she's right. And then to put that in in action was there a process in which that allowed that you worked through to get to that resolution or was it something that just snapped immediately that you that you got and, and resonated with great question johnny a lot of people don't ask that right i think it took about nine years to implement <laughs> totally right but but it did i'm, I'm yeah. being, i think it's important for people because they don't understand compound interest but it, I, I made my decision to do it. I, I think if you looked at somebody that was an addict and they said, I'm not going to drink or I'm not going to smoke um, and they have slips, you know, and, and I've been around this for a long time. I had many slips uh, along the way. It took me about nine years before I stopped having slips into scarcity, into fear. And I had five daily practices that have evolved from it that, you know, I spent my slips are now minutes and moments. They're not years months, weeks, and days. And, you know, I think it's important, whatever your objectives are, mine was to be kind and to be abundant. That was my objective, to be kind and abundant. And I had slips where I was an asshole, where I was scarce, where I, I made mistakes. And I have evolved over 15 years now to spend the, the that in, in literally minutes and moments. But I use five daily practices that have helped me evolve to that point. That nine years, there is a... That is a process that you have to get in tune with and, and learn. And I think for a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs and, and, and people who are looking at uh, to, to go down the success track, they don't realize 
uh, the lessons that compound that slowly turned your way of thinking. And if you're open to those lessons and, and being able to see them stack up to let you know, oh, <laughs> I should start steering this direction. And for you to be able to admit that took nine years, that's nine years of lessons, nine years of uh, stuff comp compounding uh, to lead me into that direction. I, I, I find that very noble. Well, we can definitely become addicted to those negative thoughts because they keep us in our comfort zone. So you mentioned substance addiction and, and it's hard to beat substances, but we can become just as addicted to those negative thoughts that allow us to feel safe, that allow us to stay in that comfort zone. And unfortunately, there are going to be slips. The problem is people look on social media, they read from all of those transformational people that you hang out with and listen to, and, and they think their life is easy. They don't have any of these slips. They don't have any of these difficult difficulties, right? They just see the duck swimming on top of the water. They don't see the paddling underneath. And that's the important part of the story, that this is a journey and, and we got to keep working on ourselves because it's easy to fall into old habits, old ways. AJ, you're nailing it, right? That's why it's learning and teaching people to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of their own potential that they're voting for. But I think it's interesting because I'm blessed to have come from, you know, the celebrity athlete and entertainer field, uh, running Lee Steinberg with the sports agency, because I can teach one lesson with credibility that a lot of people, and it helps them. When I tell them that the one thing I learned from being that CEO position of that sports agency was that no matter the billionaires, the millionaires, athletes, celebrities, entertainers, hall of famers, it didn't matter. What I learned was their life sucks just as much as mine, right? And, and, and you're talking about those legs swimming underneath. They, they have a different kind of suck, but there's almost an exact percentage of suck that everybody life has. The only difference is the truly purposeful, passionate, for me, successful people are the ones who can literally find the light, the love, and the lessons in the suck. They can learn to love to take out the trash. They can learn to love to go to a baseball practice for 15 straight years and be away from their families and have everybody steal their privacy and whatever other suck may exist from being the Hall of Fame baseball players that I knew. Their life sucks. So why not learn to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of your own potential and learn how to love the suck in your life? You know, it will help you in every measure. I believe that's the Albert Camus point in Sisyphus is to imagine him smiling as he has this curse of pushing this rock up the hill, but yet has found some way every day that he's pushing that rock up the hill to enjoy himself, to see some progress, to do it a little bit better. And if you can imagine him smiling, then, then you can look at your own life and find those opportunities to feel good, to smile, to give, to make each day of pushing that rock up the hill eventful and, and profitable and, and a lesson for you. You and I read the same books and Camus, Myth of Sisyphus is one of my favorite. I talk about by finding that light, love and lessons, instead of having the, the boulder roll to the bottom of the hill every morning, it actually allows you to plateau and grow. And through meditation in the morning, I'm able to even find a higher frequency to plateau and grow off of as a baseline so that I don't have to necessarily allow the, the boulder to roll to the bottom of the hill. And I actually even take it a step further now because of Camus and created a unwinding strategy. I tell everyone, my tomorrow starts today at 9 p.m. Because I've learned that if you, you know, all three of us want to go for an eight hour jog together, the first thing you say is, well, how are we going to warm up? Nobody understands that unwinding is warming up for sleep. And unless you have an unwinding routine, that you're doing yourself a disservice and you're actually voting into Camus' philosophy that we are all stuck pushing a boulder to the top of the hill every day just to have it roll down to the bottom. I would have taken the lessons now of plateauing and growing, finding the light, love, and the lessons in order to have that higher frequency as a baseline. Uh, but I bet you know we can go down a bunch of lists of books, but I'm oh, gonna God. throw a couple at you. Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, uh, may, may have fallen on your lap once in a while. <laughs> How about even the Course in Miracles? Is that is that one that you may have uh, ventured into yet? I do not know this one. Not yet. Bo both of you, it's a, a hidden gem. It's an onion book that I've read for five and a half years every day. I do read Think and Grow Rich every day and The Power of Intention by Wayne Dyer. Dr. Wayne Dyer is some of my favorites. Well, it's so important to be training your mind 
just as much as it is to be working on the physical and working with athletes. I think the big takeaway there of these Hall of Famers and these incredibly successful athletes is the amount of hard work that goes into it. It's not just on talent. We all see those talented superstars who who have one season or two seasons, but they don't have the consistent hard work and effort that it takes to keep honing that skill, keep advancing, keep pushing that boulder. No doubt. And it's incredible how much effort it takes and how long there are no overnight successes even the young entrepreneurs that are successful they'll tell you about you know how they were selling baseball cards when they were five or they had a lawn service or their dad made them paint fences you know it's huck finn all over again i haven't met literally one overnight success in my life and those who think they are uh, the overnight successes someone that's won the lottery for example statistic you know exactly that they're not overnight successes because the universe doesn't allow it. Most of those people go bankrupt within years, uh, just like most uh, people who get overnight uh, windfalls end up giving it back in a windfall. It takes uh, the segmentation of life. Compound interest is the biggest lesson that I love to teach, positive and negative compound interest because our senses are too weak to understand compound interest and our memories are too weak to remember compound interest. So the analogy I use is when people tell me I feel stuck, I'm like, oh, congratulations. They're like, what are you talking about? I said, you're growing, you're accelerating, you're almost there, you're stuck. They're like, no, I'm about to quit. I was like, what are you talking about? My son is 10. During COVID, I bought him a pair of shoes. Within three weeks, he was stuck in his shoes. He's like, dad, I can't get out of these. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, how the heck did that happen? And I thought to myself, <laughs> just like business happens, when you feel stuck, you're growing. You just, I had no idea my son grew that much in three weeks, <laughs> right? And I, I, I didn't know my business was growing that much in three years, six years, nine years. When I started building my brand, my favorite lesson, three and a half, maybe almost four now, the Super Bowl three and a half, four years ago, Gary V and I, I'm helping him with his sports agency with his brother, AJ. And he says to me, he goes, you should build a brand. I really like your content. And I was like, well, I don't do videos. He goes, I like your books. I've heard you speak, man. You're good. You should build a brand. He goes, how many followers uh, can I help you get? I said, I don't want followers. I want two ambassadors in year one. If you're going to help me. He goes, what's an ambassador? I said, I want two people like AJ and Johnny that are going to tell everyone to listen to my podcast, to read my books, go to my speeches, watch my TV shows, Elevator Pitch, Two Men Drill, whatever it is. I want two people out there getting me two more people every year that'll get me two more. He said, where's that going to get you? I said, well, I'm 50 years old today. When I'm 70, I'll be the most popular 70-year-old on all of social media. He said, by getting two people to get two people. I said, yeah, absolutely, do the math. And I said, here's the problem. In 20 years, I'll have 2 million people getting me 2 million people that are true ambassadors, right? Not like Selena Gomez, 160 million followers, but you can't sell out a movie. I'm talking about 2 million people that are gonna show up and stand up uh, yeah, for, for what I, I stand for, right? Real, real, right, I tried. But here's the cool thing, right? This is why people quit, because of this idea. If I ask Gary, when am I going to be halfway there? He would say 10 years. It's not true. It takes 19 of the 20 years till you get halfway there. Right. It takes 18 Double. of the 20 years to get 25% of the way there because things are doubling. And you cannot see that with our senses or our memories. So we have to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit or else we're going to create a resistance or a mismanagement of our expectations and never get there. And we're going to do the disastrous thing. We're going to quit when we're almost there. When that doubling is just one year like away and that is an investment in yourself the best investment you can make you nailed it and that's compound interest it's exactly how warren buffett became one of the richest men if not richest man in the earth now you mentioned earlier five daily practices and we love having a challenge for our audience that they can put into their life the next week what are these five daily practices that you do and can you share them with our audience as a challenge that they could apply in their own life the biggest challenge of the five daily practices are daily, <laughs> just like the thank right. you. So please remember the, the real practice is to do something <laughs> daily. But if you're able to do these daily, it'll change your life. Number one, take inventory of your values. You have personal values, non-negotiable values, experiential values, which I think are always funny because people don't think of their experiential values. And this is why when you go out with your friends, you're like, what do you want to do? They're like, I don't know. What do you want to eat? I don't know. If you're in a family situation, this is, you need to take inventory of your experiential values. You're giving values of how you provide value and 
the receiving values. If you take inventory of your values every day and know your what, your why will come out and be quite prevalent in your life. And two, you'll be able to make decisions quicker because you know your values for the day. Finally, don't be afraid of being a hypocrite. Your values are gonna change. You don't wanna tell people that you were right in the past. You wanna tell people, I've learned from the past, I've made mistakes, the dummy tax has been paid, come join me so you don't have to pay the dummy tax. The easiest way to get somewhere is to find someone that's already there and ask them for directions. So you are being able to use that value as directions. Two, ask. The number one thing I tell myself if I was 18 years old is ask you dummy, have radical humility. Ask, ask, ask. Not only how you can be a value of service to others, but more importantly than how you can help, ask people, do you know anyone that can help me? Stop thinking everyone is a, is a gatekeeper. They're all sponsors and power sponsors. When we talk about thinking about what we want, the minute my world changed was I looked at everyone around me and said, oh, he, they're here to help me. They're a sponsor. Do you know anyone that can help me? Or they could help me and they know people as power sponsor. Change my life. Three, be a student. Now this one, if somebody would have told me 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I'd be preaching being a student, I would have said, shoot me in the head. But here's what student means to me. Uh, pay attention, focus in on what you want and give it your intention. Attention plus intention, what you think, say, do and believe and even know your unconscious competencies, personality traits, characteristics, obsessions and addictions that allow for compound interest. Attention plus intention equals the coincidences in our lives. I've created a mathematical equation for luck. Attention plus intention equals coincidence. Study what you have planned, study what you don't have planned, study your sleep. Fourth, daily practice, my favorite one. I hate statistics. The only statistic I know to be true is 99% of all statistics are made up. That one I know to be true. I owned a golf course, I lost the golf course, but one statistic I learned about a golf course is 99, oh, sorry, 100% of all short putts don't go in. Still, <laughs> true. Now here's the best one. 100% of the things you do now get done. And the difference between successful people and other people is they get shit done. So do things now. Ask yourself, according to your values that you're taking inventory of, can I do it now? And if you can do it now, do it. You'll save twice as much time and be statistically exponentially more successful. If you can't do it now, put it into your calendar to study tomorrow and prioritize it then. Then finally, the biggest practice of my life, the one that set me forth on the nine-year venture to minutes and moments, it's practice ending fear. And there's four steps to practice ending fear. Number one, identify what you're afraid of. There's primary fears that Freud talks about. There's four of them. There's also secondary fears. Here's a little list of mine that I've learned over 15 years. A need to be right, a need to be offended, a need to be separate, a need to be inferior, a need to be superior, a need to be anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty. All of these are needs of the ego that I've wasted millions and millions of dollars, hours and hours, days and weeks and months of time, all getting in my own way, creating interference, voids, and shortages to what I already had as an instant between limitlessness and infinity. I already had everything and I used that fear to get away from it. Now, the first step is to identify. When you identify that you're in fear, you're on fire. When you're on fire, you gotta be a ferocious Buddha. You gotta stop, drop, and roll. Why do I say ferocious Buddha? If anyone's ever been mad or in an argument or guilty or resentful, how hard is it to stop? How hard is it to stop accelerating in the wrong direction? The last argument I had with my wife, I'm sitting there in my own head saying things going, oh my God, you didn't just say that, stop. Shut the F up, stop, stop. It took me so long because she had my adrenaline flying. I was accelerating into fear because she pissed me off and I was hungry to add, add to it. If you can stop, then drop like a Buddha, breathe through the nose, past your eyes, out through your mouth, breathe six deep breaths. If it puts you into center of neutrality, now you're ready to roll in the right direction. If you're on fire, you stop, drop, and roll. Be a ferocious Buddha. Identify when you're afraid. Stop, drop, and roll. These five daily practices, if you can do them daily, I promise will give you the compound interest of making more money, helping more people, and having more fun with your life. And some more happiness to go along with it. You got it. Thank you so much for sharing. We love asking one last question of our guests. 
and identifying a mindset that unlocks success for you. We call it your X factor. I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but what do you define as, as your X factor? You know, it's kindness. And I ask myself one simple question, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. If you're full of anxiety, fear, anger, frustration, if you're even suicidal, literally go out and do something, do a good deed, be kind. If, be kind over being right. Be kind over being fast. Be kind over being angry. If you make kindness your magic superpower, it's incredible how the universe responds with an abundant source that is full of everything for everyone. Kindness is the lens in which I live my life by. Kindness, kindness, kindness. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. At that point is so key. The kindness doesn't just extend to others. It extends to ourself in the form of self-compassion. Thank you for joining us and sharing these lessons with us. Thank you, David. You guys are incredible. Thank you so much.